So welcome, we're here at uh, AndevCon San Francisco 2014 in the foyer of the Grand Hyatt Hotel. And I'm here with Juan Gomez, Senior Mobile Engineer at Eventbrite. Hey, good morning, Juan. Good morning. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're passionate about. I'm really passionate about Android and mobile in general. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, long time, like six years of Android well, been around? six years or? of Android, and then before that I used to do a lot of um, a lot of J2ME and a little bit of Windows Mobile. No Windows Phone, Windows Mobile. Uh, so, yeah. I, Did I, you do any Palm OS too? Uh, a little bit, yes. And so a little bit of Brew. But mostly J, J2ME and, and Windows Mobile were my, my strong suit. Excellent. So what are you here speaking at the conference about? Um, my talk was yesterday. It was about app indexing, which is a, a Google technology to kind of tie your website with your app. Uh, so. It's, it's really interesting and a lot of people don't know about it, so that was kind of my, my, um, my idea to try to expose more people to it. So um, what is app indexing? App indexing is basically um, a way for when you're searching for something on Google, instead of Google sending you to uh, someone's website, and usually a lot of websites are not mobile optimized, instead of you pinching and zooming, if you happen to have um, an app for that website, uh, the Google search results will, will the Google search results will basically take you straight to the app, to the content that that you were looking for. Instead of taking you to the website, it takes you to the app. So, for instance, I'm looking for a recipe for like pumpkin pie, and I have uh, an app for recipes. And I so I search for pumpkin pie, and then when I click on it, instead of taking me to a website, it takes me to an app that I have on my phone, straight to the pumpkin app uh, recipe. Or in Eventbrite's case. If I'm looking for uh, bait to breakers or governor's ball, one of the, uh, the big events that we have, instead of taking you to our website, uh, it takes you straight to the app, straight to that event, and then you can buy tickets. Or if you uh, already have tickets, you can get directions on how to get there and stuff like that. Now give us an idea, how is this implemented inside of Android from a developer perspective? Okay, so from a developer perspective, it's actually all uh, intense. So uh, it's something that you put on your Android manifest, so when your app gets installed, uh, you get registered on, on, on the Android OS uh, for a certain type of events. So on your Android manifest, you have to give it a format, um, basically, of that URL that, that you're looking for. And then every time Google sees that URL, either on the browser, so even if it's uh, Google search results, or if someone is reading, for instance, a web page, and there, there happens to be a link that, that matches that format, whenever they tap on it, it's going to take them to your app. So it's something that happens uh, at install time, and then the, the formatting you specified on the, on the Android manifest. The minute that happens, your app gets an intent, and then you deal with the intent, you kind of deconstruct the URL, and then load up the information and show up to the user. This is really cool. Does this actually mean we can start bringing kind of the world of RESTful uh, interface design, where each resource and each location is truly addressable? Like right now in Android, when you, when you look at the API level, the addressability is achieved just by sending it to an activity, and then hidden inside of the body of the intent is, is the metadata that the activity has to decode. Is this moving us more towards that uh, addressability property? I think it, that's kind of the point, and since it still works with the URL schema, you can uh, have unique identifiers for your content, and that's that's part of the idea, uh, and that's what Google is pushing people to. Uh, it's if, if I'm looking for something specific and I click on that link, I want to see that information on the app. The problem is, um, that's where it stops. The minute you get the intent, as you mentioned, there's no real um, built-in mechanism to go straight to the content. It's some, something that the developer has to build by himself, basically. So although it's trying to get us there, there's still not, not a, a built-in mechanism on Android to, to be kind of restful and, and, and be able to address content inside an app with something like a URL, which would be ideal. Uh, but there's nothing built in at the moment. Uh, but this is kind of taking us there. So I think if, it, if this takes off, Google might think about this seriously and have a built-in way for you to address content directly within your app. Now, does this kind of uh, linking work between applications, not just from web to app, but from app to app as well? Uh, so the, this is mostly uh, web to app, so on the Google side. Uh, and that was mostly what I was covering. But there's also a really, um, a really good initiative on, on Facebook's side to do linking from app to app. So, and, and basically making it cross-platform. Because on Android, we have intents. So we can address other apps and basically uh, send information over. But they wanted to do something cross-platform, uh, and I think their initiative is called AppLinks, 
uh, so you can register with Facebook and it's basically trying to build um, inner communication between apps uh, on a cross-platform way. So it, it works on Android and iOS. And there's also an open source initiative. Um, I think it's called Open Links. I'm not entirely um, sure about that one. Uh, but it's an open source initiative since a lot of people are not scared, but they have the reservations on things that are completely driven by Google or completely driven by Facebook. Um, so this open source initiative tries to address that and be developed more in the open. They still don't have the traction that, that app indexing and maybe deep linking has on Android, but the more we, we start to see adoption, I think the more interesting this space is going to get. Now, what about content providers? Content providers are at least intended to provide us this kind of addressability of resources, but they're not necessarily linked to a display. Uh, where do you see content providers fitting in with this type of architecture? I think uh, content providers are, are, for something like this, they're ideal. Ideally, you would get uh, the URL matching on the Android side. You would get the URL passed to your app to an intent, and then ideally, you would take that URL and send, and send it to a content provider that will give you, give you what, what you want. If you use that type of architecture, it kind of ties in cleanly. The problem is content providers have their own issues uh, that I'm sure a lot of Android developers are familiar with. And, and they're also... Give us a few examples. Well, I think for, for a lot of simple cases, they're overkill. It's, it's really hard to get a content provider off the, one, off the ground and, and well implemented uh, for something simple. It's, it's, it's overkill. Uh, so sometimes people, because you need to have, uh, you need to care about like the storage and, and how you load and, and a lot of different things that, that you don't necessarily need all the time. So for stuff that's really simple, a content provider sometimes is overkill. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the, uh, of the biggest um, downsides. Uh, and and, it, and there's, there's complications. It was a great idea, but it's been around for a while. And I think I see Google kind of going back and forth with it because it used to be content providers used to be king uh, right around the first few versions of Android. But now you don't see them anymore. They don't use them on, on like the documentation. They don't recommend them as much as they used to. Uh, so I'm, yeah, content providers are not, I'm not sure if, if, if but they have their own set of problems. It's, Fair enough. Now, when you start describing this deep linking, are you doing this with just the normal HTTP scheme, or are you actually defining your own scheme and protocol in terms of the URL patterns? Um, so right now, we're using a combination of both. Um, uh, we actually went and registered with a I E. Well, the I A N A. Yeah, I A N A. <laughs> I keep forgetting the name. Uh, I A N A. Uh, we want to register um, our own protocol schema, which is what you should do. Uh, if you're a, a good net citizen. But we found out that HTTP is usually enough for most of what you need. So we have both. Uh, I'm not suggesting people go out and register their own protocol. Uh, HTTP is usually enough for most of your needs. Um, so, but we went out and did that. We just registered. And we're, we're kind of using both. We're using our own, uh, mostly on the iOS side. Uh, but on Android, we're using a combination of both. But we're finding that HTTP is solving most of our needs. Uh, so we're slowly migrating to more uh, on, on just using the HTTP one. So developers out there that are looking to do this type of uh, deep linking and uh, app indexing, they could just get started with HTTP and not have to worry about going all the way through the hoops to yes. register a custom protocol. Ideally, you should use HTTP. If you already have a website, you, you, should, you already have your, your um, kind of your URL schema, you should just use that and leverage all that value that you build on your RESTful URLs and, and your descriptive URLs, just use that and leverage HTTP. So for most use cases that most people have, HTTP should be enough. Uh, excellent. Now, uh, moving out to kind of the broader picture, what's the most exciting thing to come out of Android this year, in your opinion? Uh, well, I think the tools um, part is really exciting. Tell um, us about it. Android Studio just hit um, 1.0 as of yesterday. So uh, I think this is probably a wake-up call for everybody to just start thinking about migrating to Android Studio. It's time to let go of Eclipse and come over to Android Studio. This is the, the future of Android tooling. It's time to, to uh, dust off your Ant script and bring it out to Gradle and start embracing this new set of tools because the potential that these tools have, it's amazing. So a lot of the stuff that you used to have to jump through hoops uh, on Eclipse or AND to get off the ground. Give me some examples. Things like uh, continuous integration and, and things like deploying uh, 
alpha or beta builds from, from your, your scripts. Dependency management is a huge problem. And so a lot of people uh, used to use Maven with uh, some sort of uh, like and thing. Uh, so Gradle covers all this. So dependency management, continuous integration, testing. Uh, Gradle is great for that. So, and, and the fact that Android Studio um, works with Gradle out of the box, so you get all that power for free, basically. Um, it's a great combination. So I think Android Studio hitting 1.0, it's, it's a great milestone for, for Android developers in general, because now it's time to start switching and, and start taking advantage of this powerful tool. Do you recommend that for established projects as well as new projects? Um, I think right now 1.0, it's, it's a release candidate. But uh, as soon as, as uh, they have a, a stable 1.0, I'm sure Google will do a, um, a full-blown PR thing on it. And I think that will be the time for established projects to move to it. So I think people, now that the ERC is out, you just start exploring and seeing what things you need to fix and what you need to change to move over once the, the stable release is out. Now, what about with Lollipop and Material Design? Have you started bringing Material Design yet into your applications at Eventbrite? Yes, I think it's uh, Material Design. It's it's really interesting for developers and and for designers as well. Uh, and Lollipop, the art runtime, it's really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Project Volta uh, on Lollipop. It's a, a battery optimizing um, a strategy, and there's a lot of um, battery measuring APIs now, so you can measure the impact your app has on battery, I think that's going to be huge for a lot of, especially long running type apps. So you can be mindful of the battery that you're consuming on your user's device. Um, all that's going to be really interesting. We're starting, we're starting to look into material design. Uh, you get a lot of, uh, like if you've been using the support library uh, and, and using things like the navigation drawer or the, the um, pull to refresh, it has a different name on the support library. Uh, if you upgrade to the new support library version 21, you get all that stuff uh, with a material look and feel for free. Um, so that's, that's really convenient. So we're starting to explore and try to see how it fits together with, with our company brand and our company, uh, the direction we're heading on, on the design front. But we're definitely excited and, and are going to be embracing it really soon. Now, we're really curious as well, what libraries that are you guys using at Eventbrite? So there's a lot of really great third-party initiatives out there trying to take some of the sting and pain out of Android application development. And it's a little overwhelming for somebody just going out there and seeing a bunch of them. Which one's the best? What should we be doing when it comes to development libraries, when it comes to testing libraries, when it comes to Dagger? What are you guys doing at Eventbrite? Uh, so I, I I hate to be really prescriptive because, uh, unfortunately, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So libraries that work from, for one project are not necessarily going to work for all projects. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of good stuff out there. Definitely most of the, of the things that um, Square has open source are, are great. And I think most Android developers um, use them, or like most Android developers that I know use a lot of the stuff that um, Square puts out. Us in particular, we use um, we use Butterknife, which is like a lightweight version of, of Dagger, only for for uh, doing injection on on view related things, which is one of the most painful things on on the Android side. There's a lot of boilerplate, and and you can get a lot of advantages by using uh, dependency injection on Tell on. Us about Butterknife. Uh, so it's 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 a lightweight version of Dagger. It's still um, something that Square uh, released with that in mind. There's people that don't need the full-blown um, power of Dagger. They just need a lightweight dependency injection only around the view side. So it makes it really easy for you to um, basically wire all of your view code with your, all of your view um, layout with your view code without having to write all the boilerplate, all the find by ID and, and getting all the controls and, and matching them to specific objects that you can address on your code. It takes care of all that boilerplate. It, take it takes care of boilerplate like uh, writing click handles. You have to write a click listener for each of your controls that, that the user is going to interact with. Butterknife takes care of that too on a really clean way. So it's, it's lightweight. If you're not ready to, to, take, uh, to take on the full power of Dagger, you can start with something like Butterknife and then move on to, to, to Dagger. Uh, so Dagger is great. Um, they have Auto. We don't use Auto. We use EventBus which is the exact same um, design pattern. Uh, but we made a decision to go with EventBus for certain reasons. Um, so when should people be looking at using either Odo or EventBus? Uh, what, what problem are we using these to solve? EventBus is a, it's a really powerful um, pattern when, uh, when you have a lot of uh, broadcast uh, listeners and broadcast um, 
centers basically on on your app because it can it's it's a it's a good thing that the that the Android platform has, but when you're using it a lot, it gets really really confusing to follow the code. And the biggest problem that uh, broadcast uh, listeners have, and, and and the broadcast pattern in general, is that there's no type safety because you basically put everything on a on a on a bundle and you throw it out, and then you have to basically unpack it and then verify it. The biggest advantage of using an event bus is that you have type safety because the, the event bus requires you to put a type, a specific Java type on the bus. And then um, any activity or any component on your app that are listening for that specific type will get notified as soon as that type is available on the bus. So you, ha you get the type safety. You don't have to check if, if the object that's um, in that broadcast is what you're looking for or not. And that's a huge advantage. And, and it saves you from writing a lot of boilerplate code and the code just becomes a lot more readable and a lot more um, easier to maintain. The less code you write, the less um, bugs basically that, that you're opening yourself up to. So it's, it's, it's a good, when, you, when you're feeling that you have a lot of broadcasts and, and a network of broadcasts that goes all around your app that is getting really hard to maintain, it, that's when you, you need to start looking at something like an event bus. And now, looking forward from where we are now, where would you like to see Android go in the next few years? And what would make your life easier as a developer and an engineer writing these killer apps? How would you like to see the Android platform support you? Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm really excited about tools. And one thing on the tool side and language side, I'm really excited about Java 8 and, and Lambdas and, and, and how concise and, and clean the language becomes. Uh, so I'm excited for Android to adopt that. What we're doing now, um, at least uh, so is Android adopting it yet? Project. Does Android support Java 8? Not, not out of the box. So what you can do is, and that's what I was recommending people to just move on to Android Studio. It's on Android Studio and, and on Gradle too. You can basically configure the the IDE and 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 the build system to use. Uh, I, right now, I think it supports the Java 7 syntax, but I think Java out is either out or it's going to be out really soon. Uh, so you can use the Java 8 syntax. So you can use all the great lambdas, and you can use all. Uh, uh, maybe not the, the splitterators and the streams and the, all the fun stuff, but at least the syntax part. And then the IDE and the, the, the Gradle system will take that code and then rewrite it for you on a, on a nice uh, Java 7 compatible way so that it can be compiled on Android and, and shipped on the apps. But at least the code that you're writing um, on the IDE, you can take advantage of all that nice syntactic sugar um, and not have to, to be waiting for Android to adopt basically Java 8. So, so you can take some of the advantages by using Android Studio and configuring to, to use the Java 8 um, syntax. Just to get that clear, so what you're saying is we can use the Java 8 language syntax, but we're still using the old Java 6 and libraries in terms of the actual APIs. Correct, so Android still supports Java 6. So what the IDE does is it rewrites that in a way that the Java 6 compiler can compile it and then put it on, on, the, on the Android device. So it's still running on Java 6. It's still, when it compiles, it's still Java 6 syntax, but the IDE is doing the, the heavy lifting for you and translating those idioms into actual Java 6 code that can be compiled on Android. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's really always a pleasure having you with us and getting to hear all the great things you guys are doing at Eventbrite and just sharing it with the Android community. This okay. is just an exciting time to be an Android developer. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go enjoy the show.